Welcome to the Wealth Matters Podcast, where investors come together to better understand how to build passive cash flow and create generational wealth without all the confusing mumbo jumbo. Here's your host and co author of Amazon number one bestseller, Alpesh Pamar. Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. I have with me, Mr. Jonathan Turtle. How are you, Jonathan? I'm very good. Thanks for having me on. Excited Absolutely. to be here. Absolutely. So Jonathan has extensive real estate background, knowledge and experience, and he started very early growing up in a real estate family, which is pretty rare, especially with all the you know interviews I've done. His father was a general contractor for over 80 custom homes including being selected as a preferred home builder by Inland Real Estate. And Jonathan is now the founding director of Revenue Ascend, a digital marketing agency, which was selected as one of Chicago's most inspiring stories by Chicago Voyage magazine. Also, but we want to talk about real estate here. And, and the reason I have Jonathan here is talk about mobile homes themselves as investment. Welcome, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's uh yeah, when, it, when you talk about mobile homes, it's kind of a unique niche. So people get kind of thrown off, but now it's getting really mainstream. So hopefully I can you know, provide some high-value insights to your audience here. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to learning as well, because uh, as, as we mentioned right before the show that I bought my first mobile home park this year, and I'm looking to buy. But of course, all of these uh, mobile homes are park-owned homes. So that's what ex- actually kind of you do while flipping mobile homes uh, themselves. So we'll talk about those. But uh, first, let's get, get started. Tell us something interesting or funny about yourself. That's a unique question. You throw me for a curveball here. <laughs> I think, <laughs> uh, I think I, something funny. I think nowadays, if you see me now, like I'm kind of just casually, I just wear my own brand sweaters and t-shirts, especially because right, right. everyone it's nowadays, because you work from home. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We all work from home nowadays, but about uh, it, seven years ago, I was voted the best dressed Chicago. And so I trained Chicago business and also Fox news. So I used to always wear like, everyone used to call me Scott Disick when he was wearing suits back in the day. Uh-huh. And now I'm the same thing. I'm just wearing all sweatpants and sweatshirts, right. but in the tech and mobile home park industry, that's really you don't really dress up and nowadays everyone works from home. So I think that's kind of people that know me from about 10 years ago, they used to be like, I would never dress down. I'd be like going to like a friend's house on like a Tuesday and I'd be in a full suit and like, oh, wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> now it's like, you're like, you were from that extreme. So now you don't even like you're in joggers and like, right. <laughs> like, you know, loafers or something. So awesome. Okay, so when and how did you start investing in real estate? Sure. Yeah. I've been uh, like, like you alluded to in the beginning, I grew up in the real estate family. So that gave me kind of a, a an edge. Uh, my dad was even from like a little kid. Uh, like you said, he was a custom home builder. He also had three real estate offices. So when, instead of playing video games, which I, I obviously did my fair share of that too, when I was a kid, but I'd be a lot of times to go on the job sites, you know, five, six, seven years old, seeing all the ins and ins and outs. And then also on the brokerage side. So just really seeing that and like the hard work and obviously in real estate, when you're first getting started or you really want to get ahead, you work weekends on like a nine to five. Um, and so I really saw the work ethic. I really saw the different real estate cycles because this was in the eighties. Um, and some of you know, we had, you know, stock market crash and we had the savings and loans disaster, which was like Illinois, Florida, and Texas were like the three biggest States. Obviously we're in Illinois. So we got really hit by that as well. So really seeing the different challenges and nuances of, uh, different uh, economies, and then also seeing real estate from multiple angles. I think that kind of gave me a really competitive advantage. And then my dad and I got our first park about 15 years ago. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So at that time it was kind of still, it was still kind of unique. Well, not many people really knew about it. Uh, I would tell my friends, I'd be like, what mobile home park? What is that? They just thought it was the funniest thing ever, especially you're like in your twenties. They're like, okay, mobile homes. Okay. <laughs> And then now every one of them wants to invest. So it's kind of funny how that all flipped. And then like, obviously, Wall Street's the huge indoor space. Um, you know, you're seeing a lot of major publications, all the yes. you know, Wall Street Journal, everyone talks about it now. So it's kind of cool to see the whole transition over the last 15 years. No, that's awesome. So, so you have been in real estate for a while. Uh, compared to you, I'm a newbie. I uh, started 
learning about real estate uh, in 2011 and pretty much started heavily investing since 2015. So I'm, I'm still a nice. newbie, <laughs> taking baby, baby steps. Nice. No, at least the more you compound and more you put into it and take action, that's the biggest thing with real estate uh, is get some mentors, actually take action, get in part of deals and you got to learn, you learn the best that way. So that's the key. Got it. So uh, we mentioned mobile home parks and I think everyone understands it's a park or a trailer park, which is what was called, uh, called before. So what do you see uh, a difference between mobile homes from let's say 15 years ago to now, I think they have changed a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, so here's a kind of, it, the 90s was like the heyday of manufacture for mobile homes. I think at the peak, uh, like late 90s, it was like 375 or 400,000 mobile homes per year. And just to give you context right now, the last couple of years, it's been pretty consistent, 95 to 100,000 new manufactured wow. homes per year. Wow. That's and the reason is, years. yeah, the reason is, uh, anything past 1976 when HUD became involved before that, anybody could build a mobile home. Like you could just have like, you know, like your backyard and you have a big yard and you could start building your own mobile homes. That's how it was pre-HUD uh, before 1976. After that, government came in and said, hey, no, this is people's, you know, they have to live. So we're going to have certain stipulations. Yeah, uh, but the quality of the homes, like anything from the 90s on, they'll have the shingles, they will be the build quality, uh, the width will be everything you want and like a normal affordable housing. So from the mid nineties on, it's going to be pretty comparable to the newer, newer homes. But uh, the reason going back to why they sold so many was there was lending. You could get a 30 year uh, loan on the house. And the problem was they were, it was kind of like the same thing that happened in 2005, six, seven housing crash where they just kind of gave loans out to anybody. You could, you know, you could buy multiple houses. It was the exact same thing with uh, the mobile homes in the 1990s. And there was companies that, uh, would just lend billions of dollars and do 30 year loans on mobile homes. You know, and we're talking a 40, $50,000 house. So 30 year loan is kind of, so some people walk away and that's what pretty much all these new laws came in after that, basically. So shadow financing, it just became banks didn't want to deal with it. There was a lot of problems after that. Um, so that's what really changed it. But the newer mobile homes, if you ever get a chance, go to the Louisville show. They got obviously canceled this year. It would be normally the second week of January. And if you walk through new homes, if you're in either like you're in San Francisco, I'm in Chicago, you see the interior of these homes, the new homes, that fifty, eighty thousand dollar home, it's literally like going to like, you know, your three, four, five, six thousand dollar a month apartment. You're in a sink, you know, like in right. major city. The quality is beautiful, like it's it's crazy how much they've advanced, like, you know, the branding of it. So back in the day you think of like the, you said the trailer, you think of M and M, eight mile, you know. But nowadays if you went to a new mobile home, they're like they're really, really nice. That's awesome. So let's talk about flipping. How do you flip mobile homes? Yeah, so this is the unique niche about it. You can see I have a, a little course coming out. Uh, we have a fund, the Midwest Park Capital, which is for a credit investor, but I have a lot of people I know that want to get involved with this space. And the good thing about it is it's the easiest form of real estate to get involved with. It's basically kind of like flipping cars. You don't need to get your real estate license. You don't need a large amount of capital. Maybe California, it's a little different yeah. dynamic over there. <laughs> <laughs> But you can still, what even over there, just give you an uh, example, you can flip trailers over there and make a hundred thousand dollars per flip. So it's all relative. Like over here, say you're in the Midwest, you're in Indiana, Wisconsin, Illinois, and you're flipping a you know seventies or early eighties mobile home, you could probably get it for three or five thousand, if not less, put three or four grand in it and flip it for fifteen, twenty, make you know five to ten thousand dollars with like less than a week of work. And the beauty about flipping mobile homes is the really cool thing is unlike those TV shows where everyone else is, you know, like how many flipping TV shows do you see out there for single family? It's like 30, 30 shows out there. Everyone and their brother has a flipping show, but there's not one teaching you how to flip mobile homes, but 22% of America lives in mobile homes. One fifth of America lives in mobile homes, yet there's 30 shows basically how to flip homes. And what's the problem about that? Well, if one fifth of America needs that affordable housing and you're an investor and you're first starting off in real estate or you just want to get your you know, feet wet, you're not going to go the you know the Chase Bank. Chase Bank now requires seven or seven twenty credit. Let's say you're making in the six hundreds. Okay, well they want twenty you know fifteen twenty percent down. Okay, I'm buying a house that's two or three hundred thousand. I put all this money down, and that's not including the repairs. So it's like it's a it's really hard for everyday American, even if it's a hundred two hundred thousand house, and you put twenty thirty grand, you have to have good credit, and then you have to know how to do the work. 
And most people, unless they're, you know, skilled phrase men or they have somebody they know and trust because, you know, people get ripped off all the time. They hire random people and they just take the money and run. So it really solves that the mobile home flipping and the mobile home investing is just a really cool niche that affects a large portion of people. And what the value for the people is if going back to what you said with the new mobile homes, if they keep these older mobile homes, it's a lot more affordable for the everyday American. So if you flip a 70s or early 80s home, and now you're keeping a fifteen twenty thousand dollars home and it's beautified and brand new and it's good for another 30 years, it's way cheaper for that family that needs that affordable housing than going to buy an $80,000 home. So you're doing, you're helping them get a better home. It's Everything's going to be new and nice inside and you make a nice profit. And the best part is it's not crazy complicated. There's not all these challenges that, you know, the normal real estate has, like a you know, family real estate has. That's awesome. So, uh, and of course, we are going to dig deep, but what strategies do you use in buying these homes first? Sure. It goes back to like even r- traditional real estate uh, brokers. So one of the easiest ways I would first start off with, uh, besides obviously Facebook, Craigslist, I'll go more in depth in that in a minute, but Fizbo's drive around, look through Google, the local parks in your area, see which ones are, put in MapQuest or, you know, Google Maps, you map maps, you're efficient. And then literally just drive for the for sale by owner signs. Because usually those people, A, they don't want to work with a broker. B, they're not marketing it. They're just putting a window and hoping somebody drives by. They're not a guarantee, like 9 out of 10, from our experience, is advertising on Craigslist or Facebook. So it's only the people that are literally driving through the park see that (laughs) unit. So you come up to them and say, hey, what are you looking for? And sometimes some of these people, you're not trying to lowball them, but see what what, what they're really looking to acquire. And the beauty about it is, unlike regular real estate, there's not a lot of, you know, there's not like the Zillow trilogy. Yeah, you might see a mobile home here and there on there. But no, there's not like a really a market for the actual prices. So it's kind of like arbitrage. Think of like if you have an e-commerce store and you're drop shipping items, like you, you can market a little better and position a little brighter. You can make all the money in between there. And so solving that problem for that person that doesn't want to market it, just wants to get out of it. A lot of times there's just people that just want to just get out of it and move to another state. So they're not really looking to maximize dollars. So just being creative, just finding it, drive through the parks, see who has a FISBO for a sale by owner, talking to them. You could do a sale and contract, get, uh, fix them, flip it. There's a couple different strategies you could do with it. And then if you want to be, you know, you're in Silicon Valley, San Francisco area, market on Facebook. Facebook marketplace is super effective. It's crazy how effective it is. So you take it from one avenue arbitrage into another marketing Craigslist of Facebook. And it's, it's pretty incredible. It's the people you see, like we get, you know, except for as I do in our communities, I'll get 65, 70 year old people that you wouldn't think would be, they're like, Oh, thank you so much. I found this on, on Facebook. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so they're looking on there. Oh, so yeah. you could, and that's half your demographic. So it's, it's kind of arbitrage and it's not it's super complicated. And most mobile home owners, they don't want to deal with brokers and then brokers, how many brokers do you know that want to go take their Sundays to show, uh, you know, yeah. sell mobile homes for $200, $100? Yeah. They don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. They are not going to make much and they don't want to even, you know, venture out in some of these parks. <laughs> yeah. They wouldn't make a, they, and plus they have to have a percentage to their brokerage house. They would never, they don't even like working unless it's a certain, like we were talking before yeah. this, unless it's like a big enough commission. So that's your angle. Cost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They'll spend more in time and gas and food to get there. So, which is perfect for the investors. You come in and scoop it up. You make a boat line share of the money while also providing affordable housing to people. And you solve that pro- person's problem. while also solving somebody else that needs affordable housing problem. Everyone wins. It's pretty cool. So what are the strategies do you use to acquire them? So you found the home. Now mm-hmm. do you do subject to, do you do lease option or just buy it outright? Yeah, it depends. It, well, one thing you have to do is uh, do a kind of competitive analysis of the market. Um, and what you could do too is when you first, even if you were not, not even acquire something, do a test ad, like you have something in, in a, a local market. So just kind of do like an ad and then put it in a marketplace and say, hey, I have this two bedroom coming to the market soon, you know, because you're going to find something. So you test it out, coming to market soon, mobile home, give it like, uh, you know, highlights of what you think, general things that people want, and then see if you get 20 or 30 in- inquiries. If you get 20 or 30 inquiries, you're pretty much golden because, you know, marketplace is free. You can do the boost a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you can't do super targeting like business manager, but you'll get enough eyeballs on it. If you, get, if you want to put an extra five or 10 bucks to kind of, you know, to verify that's a product market fit, throw in five or 10 bucks, 
See if you get 20 or 30 inquiries. If you have 20 or 30 inquiries, you'll see what people are asking for in that market. You'll see if people are asking, do you do rent to own? Do you, you know, do you provide financing? Or you'll say, hey, I'm, I'm a cash buyer. And you know, with Facebook ads, or, you know, Google uses the highest intent. With Facebook, you'll still get, let's say of those 20 or 30, four or five will be serious. Two will be your, your buyer or, you know, somebody. Then you decide what you want to do. And then you can know that's the knowledge you need to go into that market with whatever you want to do and whatever your business strategy is too. If you're looking to do selling contract or you acquire a few of them uh, or you're just trying to fix and flip, or it also depends if you're you, like, say you acquired a few of FISBO, you drove around, talk to the person, they're moving to Florida. They don't really care. They say, I just give me, two, if you give me whatever number and you can arbitrage it, provide a contract and you just basically right. flip the contract basically. And you say, I'll market it for you. I'll pre-qualify everyone. And then just have everyone show up on like a Saturday, Sunday, back to back to back from the Facebook ads and then you do it, you know, do the contract there. Cause remember it's just, it's like flipping cards, you know, you're, you're trading yeah. titles and vents. <laughs> That's right. it. So, uh, so yes, uh, we spoke about finding them, then acquiring them and you kind of mentioned how uh, you sell it. So again, I, I want to dig deep. How are you selling these homes again on different, uh, are there different strategies and do you Facebook some of them? It, it depends on what you're best for us, for what makes best of us, because we, as park owners, this is just a side income, which is great. And we talk about this in the course, like eventually to really provide that long-term income, like you're a park owner, you want to own the park. And then that's a, sub, and a secondary income is flipping trailers and you know, bringing tenants in uh, is the ideal. What you want to do is have you know, tenants paying down your mortgage. So we teach them, you know, find a local area where it's a mom and pop because the majority of our industry is highly fragmented. And most of these people that own it, I'm like pretty much all other real estate classes is we're pretty much mostly mom and pop ownership, like 85 to 90% still, still currently, which means it's a great opportunity for people to come in for the next, we have like a five or seven year run to this point. I think more like five because everyone's trying to get in their space. We did yes. so well <laughs> this year with COVID crushed so many other, and we did right now just give people context 94% collection rate eight and uh, collections in mobile home park rents, according to institutional data, comparatively apartments, you know, Grant Cardone's like, oh, indestructible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they had like 75 to 78 nationally. So we have a 20 some percent higher collection rate. And remember our demographic, there's 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day. 70% yes. of them only collect social security and have very little savings, like 30 or 40,000. So they in our mobile home and every market is usually a third the price of a house and half a price of a, a garden style apartment of the exact same yes. quality. And the thing is on top of that, so we have 10,000 people every single day that need that affordable housing. You can't develop new parks. You basically have, you're, you have this moat, you control everything. So you're going to have so much demand. You're solving this problem. And it, that's the beauty about this industry. So the marketing isn't uh, just doing your deal research, but you have the demand there. You just kind of put it out there. That's awesome. So uh, another, I have a couple more questions regarding the strategy. One is, can you do this remotely, right? So let's say I live in California. I don't have anything to do in, um, let's say, you know, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, or, you know, somewhere in Kentucky. Can I do this remotely? And how would that work? It, it would be, you'd have to have a really good systems in place. I mean, and people you trust. So you could buy a quiet room, but you need to have somebody walk through it to make sure, you know, like verify the title, of, you know, walk through the unit, not just have this person say, oh, it's great. And then you come in there and like, it's missing the AC unit or something. Uh, so yeah, you'd have to have some systems and processes in, in place. We, we also kind of teach, uh, do like a weekend trip or something like that and yes. build yeah. up, you know, do like a weekend trip, make a kind of vacation, drive for like one or two hours get your, and then make, you know, the rest of your time, free time for yourself because the, Flip, fixing and flipping of the units, you can't really do much because the, the bulk, mobile home is basically a box. But you can't change the outside window size or you can't change put up a bigger door because that's the structure of the unit. That'll actually make the whole thing fall down, which is so you could, you know, power wash or paint the outside, you know, fix the roof if it needs that, replace the shingles, put some plants up front, like put a new deck, paint the deck. On the outside, that's really mostly all you could do. <laughs> you know, that's literally it. On the inside, it's literally replace some carpet, make sure the floor is good, you know, sink, you know, kitchen appliances, make sure they're decent working. Uh, and it depends on your market. If you're in like a 
second or tertiary market, small town, and the average house is 150, 200,000. People just want a, a, a cheap, affordable place to live. So they're not expecting like, you know, laminate flooring and like, or bamboo flooring and some like whatever, <laughs> you know, the, the stainless steel, you know, touch screen refrigerator. They're, I mean, they're not expecting that at all. They just want something clean. So knowing your market, and we help with that too, but just kind of knowing your market, if the average house in the area is not too expensive, it's just like regular real estate, you go with the market. Uh, less is more, less is more. Like you don't have to go over the top. Like majority, your demographic, understanding your avatar, understanding your clientele is in most markets. And there's also like a senior market. Senior market probably just wants better gardens and better amenities. So if the park, you're acquiring the, the home, always go to the park uh, manager or the park owner and say, hey, I'm going to help market these for you. Would you, you know, be cool with me, us doing that? That's a big thing. There's not everyone will, but there's always a percentage of like, like I said, we know these are second, third generation uh, mom and pop owners. They really just care about having the park full, collecting rent, because every time there's a, you know, a tenant paying rent there, that's equity towards the value of the community, you know, what they're worth basically. So they're not, you know, after they've had it for 30 years, some are kind of hands off at this point. They're not like, I've done this for 30 years. If you want to come in and, you know, keep the park or the unit in the park, you want to put your own capital in it and you're going to market for me and I have to, and I get to prove the tenant. Cool. You can do that all day. <laughs> you're doing me a favor because I don't want to do the work. I've been, you know, I'm 75 years old at this point. Like, I would, you know, some of the five owners, they've had them for 30, 40 years. Uh, they'd be like, yeah, you can do the work. And then uh, I prove the tenant. Perfect. Cause it keeps the capital. And then I keep the, now I have a better, uh, you know, it keeps the equity, it keeps the cash flow, And now I'm making the park look better for everyone else coming in. So I have, I have two more questions on those. Sure. I was going there actually, because as I mentioned, I own the park and uh, um, almost all the homes are park owned homes. We want to convert them to tenant owned homes, but the market doesn't support it. So right now we are rehabbing the home. So do you work with park owners like that where they have park owned homes and you, you come in and say, okay, I'm gonna help you flip this homes? That would be something like we won't do it for our business model because we have our park and our fund and then the course, but I would be an opportunity for some, like for somebody listening, that's a great opportunity. You could say, Hey, we, you know, if you could come up with a financial agreement, you could split the profits. You guys, it's how creative you want to be. And that way it gives you guys, and there's like, it goes back to my last example. It gives you have, you have the asset. You just, you just don't want to spend all your capital on something that somebody else could take a little piece of the pie, but you're keeping your cash flow and everything on your side good in a good situation. So I would kind of put that out there to see if there's other real estate investors or maybe somebody's listening to the show and say, hey, if you want to put in the capital, we have the team. And because the first, especially if you're in your first couple parks, it's the the learning curve. The biggest thing is understanding the, yeah, the tenants stay for 14 years and you can't develop new ones. There's only about 10 new parks. The biggest challenge is building and making sure your infrastructure and systems are processed and any old units are up to speed and your, your CapEx is caught up. Once your CapEx is caught up, which means, you know, the streets, fixing your potholes, any, cutting any trees that are, you know, going to fall in a home. Uh, if you're in the Midwest, you also make sure, like, you have, you know, plowing, <laughs> things of that nature. But when you first acquire the park, so if, you, if it's a set, you know, the homes are 60s, 70s, or early 80s, or they're, they haven't been taken care of, it's going to take some more capital X and that, that's the part where the park, that's where you bring as owner, you build a lot of sweat equity over the next, because once that's taken care of, now you can reposition, you could probably even reply, I don't know if you have uh, Fannie or Freddie financing, but you can go back and say, hey, this park is, we've cleaned, you know, power wash every unit, we've painted the other units, we have skirting and everything, the, you know, we put this cap back, so now we get better financing with Fannie and Freddie. So, but for the people listening, you could say, hey, Let's start off, let's do one or two, start with one, prove the model, see if you want to invest, you like it, we'll give you exclusive access to the next five or 10 units we have here in the home. You guys could just negotiate what makes sense. And that's kind of what we see. So basically say, hey, we already have the asset, we're gonna give you exclusive rights, uh, and we could help you with this, but you just have to provide the capital, we'll provide the tools, or however you want to negotiate that, and you guys kind of split a profit. And then you get, to, they get the advantage of actually getting exclusive access to these listings, and then B, you get the value of keeping the unit in the park and then increasing the value of your equity and you know, everything makes sense that way. So, and uh, another question, cause I work with a lot of other park owners as well. And they're usually apprehensive about 
you know, letting uh, investors buy homes in the park and then renting them out. They're, now they are losing the control. Either they want the tenants directly owning the homes or they want to own the homes. They don't want a third party involved. So have you, have you seen that and how do you uh, work around that issue? Yeah, well, first, like I said, go back to, great to the manager, wait right for the owner first and say, I'm not taking this out. I'm only here to help you. Are you, you know, maybe five out of 10, seven out of 10, they'll say no, but there's still three or five out of 10, they'll say yes. Um, and there's, especially that if it's not an institutional property, we already know most of them are single, you know, they have one or two, uh, they're second, third generation owners, just say, hey, I'm not looking to do this. I've, you know, experienced, um, we do a one-off test example. Literally, you get to prove the tenant anyway. It's your park, you know, your rules and regulations for who, who comes in. But the beauty for you as the park owner is now that 75 or, you know, 1972 unit, I'm going to put three or four grand into it. So now you could have better tenants coming here. And then also, as we beautify, like even on the outside, we power wash it or we paint the outside. Now you're showing the other tenants in your community, this is a new standard of what's going on. Like, hey, that unit just did that. Now I should do that. And you kind of create that little momentum. So everyone else, so that, as a park owner, you can say, hey, now you're going to have other people see that the, 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 you know, the old unit there that was kind of neglected and made people you know, look down upon the park is now the, one of the nicest units in the park. You're going to have better sentiment, better positive reputation among your, you know, your tenants, basically. So and it's, it's a numbers game. There's 44,000 parks in the country. Uh, every state has, you know, and there's more than that's, that are smaller, like one off, like 15, 20 units that are not included in that list. But there's enough parks per state. And, that, and you're not super competitive because you're not competing when you're doing the mobile home side. You're not competing with tons and tons of people like we mentioned before. So a little bit of the work is going right to the manager and say, hey, we're going to make your job easier. Would you just try one, see if you do we're not taking it out. And you don't really want to take it out, honestly, because it costs yeah, them yeah. to transport it. <laughs> you got to get a licensed insured driver. You yeah. have to find a place to put it. You have to reinstall. It's like seven to $10,000 to move it. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, let, let me ask you now that you have done this so many times, are there any gotchas to keep in mind while flipping mobile homes? Any, I didn't hear the first part. Any what? Are, are there any gotchas, right? Are there any, uh, you know, things you need to keep in mind while flipping homes? Yeah, yeah. The big key, uh, the title, make sure you have it in your hand. It's back taxes. And sometimes the back tax is not a bad thing. It actually worked to your advantage. Uh, because, for example, like uh, in Illinois, if you had a mobile, if you lived across the street in like a small town, and because there's not really any, there's one right outside Chicago, but most of them are second tertiary markets. So like they're a couple hours or an hour from major cities usually. And in these small towns, like say the average house is 150, 200,000, that real estate tax, like Illinois is really, really high. Just like California is really high in taxes, but Illinois is astronomical for real estate taxes. I think we're the highest in the country. It'd probably be three or $4,000. That's the 200,000 at home uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then across the street, if they live in a mobile home park, they're paying like 10 bucks a month. So they're saving three grand as another value as a tenant. You're saving three grand a year and uh, they stay there 15 years. That's 45,000. It's not equity, but it's tax savings. And you get the same school, same fire, same police. So it's one of the crazy advantages of it. So look, but on the, what you're looking for when you're buying it, they say, hey, I haven't paid in taxes. We, you know, make sure the taxes are caught up. If they're not, this actually worked your advantage. You could say, oh, we owe like $5,000, or $5,500 in taxes or $1,000 in taxes cool, we'll pay for those, but I'm going to give you a lower price for the unit. So it's a kind of like, it's kind of like when you're negotiating, it gives you like bigger pieces of pie. You could say, Hey, I could solve this problem for you, but now I'm going to give you $500 less or, you know, not, not just $500. I'll give you X amount less for the actual unit because I'm solving your tax problem. You don't want that tax problem to follow you around. I'll solve that problem for you. Plus as a bonus, I'll, you know, I'll buy this unit off you. So it actually works to your advantage. If there's a little, you know, money owed on it, uh, make sure, just do a little market research. What's the market entail? Like I said, it's, it's, the data is not fully out there. There's like the MH mobile home park store and there's a uh, MH village and some of these other websites that actually have like some mobile home park information, but, and then Zillow and Trulia will have ones that are listed by brokers, which nine out of 10 times, they don't even know how to price them. <laughs> They're just like usually so overpriced. So if you see those, mark those and then circle back and like, you know, after three months, cause they definitely aren't going to sell. Because the broker thinks it's like a house and doesn't know how to price it. Be like, hey, no, we can call, come and solve this problem for you. Because, you know, brokers, you don't have to pay them six points. I was, you know, the commission. 
Um, and then they never show it and they don't even know how to price it. And, I'll, and then you come in, you have all the leverage because just like in regular real estate, you come back and saying, hey, I'll solve this problem for you. Um, yeah, so the, make sure the VIN, taxes, uh, and then just do a thorough walkthrough. And then you could also, what you could do is like a, a high level tip too, is just whenever you're looking either when acquisition or find a park or you could just go drive a day and night if you're really at that stage, go and act like, hey, I'm buying this for my grandma or my mom. She's going to retire over here. What are you, what's your thoughts? How's this park? How's the owner? How's everyone treat you here? Is there any problems? They'll tell you everything. They'll, you know, you'll probably want to walk away after 10 minutes because I'll tell you their whole life. They'll start talking yeah, about yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything going on, but you'll get an inside perspective. And like, oh, is any, do you know any of the other units, how much they've sold for here? They'll give you all the, it's kind of like your boots on the ground, your high level information. Is they'll come out like if you drive pull up you're a foreign car or you see a, a car and somebody foreign to their you know community they're like dress down don't look don't pull up in uh another tip don't just pull up if you're you know if you have like mercedes or you know high end bmw don't drive that go to go to enterprise or go to you know Turo and get like a 20 dollar car <laughs> in a, in a button up shirt don't look like you're trying to buy them out so they don't want it they won't talk to you but if you look like the part like hey you know, I'm looking to buy this for my mom or grandma or whatever it is. You get the inside perspective. So, so those tips will definitely help. The sound went out. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I can hear you now. So, uh, yeah, now I remember, and I was going there as well, the title, tax, and insurance piece. How do you make sure that the title is solid? Because this is a personal property. Yeah, exactly. There's a new, I just found about the source too. Uh, it's called, I mean, I think it's called Snickerfish or Snickfish. Yes, yeah, Snickfish. Yep. Yeah, I just found out about them. And they're just like, they seem to have this on point. I haven't used them yet, but... I'm definitely going to use them. It seems like they, as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I mean, there's not a lot of resources in that regard. So sometimes it's kind of just doing your own due diligence, but like, I just found out about them in the last couple months here. So I think they seem to be a good resource. Got it. And what about, do you keep insurance when you buy the home and how, how do you get the insurance? Yeah. And then, so working, this industry has got a lot of little weird gray area so one thing i didn't even get to mention too i should probably bring this up too if you're the park owner there is the 21st cash program too so if you're yeah, looking to bring in yeah. you, know, so, you know i think it's 10 minimum homes if you want to bring in brand new homes it's a warren buffett's program basically be, yeah. they also have some financing options too to provide i forgot to mention uh for even used homes i've heard i haven't explored it yet but i've heard that besides local credit unions um and then so deal with them and they'll have different requirements of what they want, you know, and then also, and I always make sure everyone's licensed, bonded, insured, whatever, it, it, everything signed, make sure they sign it, make sure they prove or demonstrate your contractors, anybody you have working, unless they're part of your existing team already, but like, you still want that, but having everyone licensed, bonded, insured, have kind of an insurance policy, umbrella policy. And then there's also, uh, uh, there's some manufactured housing. If you're in the, in the obviously you need manufactured housing if you own the park insurance. So there's mobile insurance. It's like the big uh, Kurt Kelly is a big yes, player. Yes, yes, um, yes. Yeah, for parks. Awesome. So uh, no, this was awesome. Let's take a quick break, and after the break, I will go through the usual questions I ask every guest. <laughs> You're listening to the Wealth Matters Podcast. The Wealth Matters Podcast. For more info about what we do, check us out at wealthmatters.com. It's wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H, matters, M-A-T-R-S, dot com. Welcome back to Wealth Matters Podcast. Jonathan, are you ready for five rounds? I'm excited. Let's go. Let's go. Would you be changing any business or investment strategy after coronavirus? No, because I was positioned correctly. I was. I learned a lot from the last downturn and ended up being in the, the right niche. That's awesome. <laughs> Favorite real estate or finance or any other related book? There's so many. I, I read about 115 books last year. It's hard to believe. But one tip wow. I could say, here's how I did it, though. I did um, uh, Scribd, the app, and then every – because I work out – 
five or six days a week for an hour, hour and a half usually. So I do the audio book. So the audio book, an average audio book, six or eight hours. So you get one book a week right there. And then at night, I use it, you know, before I go to sleep, I do that or I do pod, you know, podcast, just continue with education. But if for this episode, I think uh, would pertain the most, uh, like zero to one, which is yes. just, yeah, he's from your area, <laughs> Peter yeah. Till. And then also I like uh, Sam Zell, Am I Being Too oh, Subtle? Yes. He's the big, biggest mobile home park owner in the country and the biggest real estate owner in the country. No, oh, that's, that's the book I got to read for sure. Any tool or website you recommend or you cannot live without? I got, this is another thing. I, I'm uh, being a digital guy. I'm, I like I have so many SaaS. I just think it comes down to just having, I just clarify as having just a, um, a cell phone because everything pertains to that. And then just having uh, all your apps and your scheduling, everything booked and categorized on there because I use probably 40 different softwares and, I can't say one's better than the other, basically, at this point. Okay, I'm going to email you. I, I would like to know about those softwares. <laughs> okay, sure. Any advice for beginner investors? I think pertains to both of us. Like when you always absorb as much content, through podcasts, whatever you, you want to learn about, put, you have so much great free knowledge that was never available even five or ten years ago. You have so much free knowledge that pertains and the world's moving so fast. This, is, this information, if you could take, absorb it, get a mentor or two and take action, get courses. Like I learned a lot from courses. Like right now, this has been a huge explosion this year because everyone's staying at home. Yeah, you can watch Netflix or you can do something that improves your life. So taking courses, listen to podcasts, reading books, listening to books, and then getting mentors and going out and doing it because right now we have anybody – it has, you know, the ability to do really well if they execute on it and just take action, commit to it every day, and it will compound over and over. And that's the, really the way to win is just to put the effort into it. And it might not be easy at first, but if you keep pushing, keep learning, keep executing, get the right mentors, pay for the right, you know, content, and listen to the free content on podcasts, you will win eventually. You find the right product market fit, and you find something you're passionate about, but you could actually do the action, you take the action even on your weekends when other people are relaxing you win. That's a great advice. And, and, and I, I could not agree more. The amount of resources you have available from education perspective, all the way to systems and processes, as you mentioned, 40 softwares, you know, none of those were available five years ago, right? right. Manage the entire thing end to end, Trilo to Ashan, Asana to Calendly, that yeah. is Slack, that is so much. And of course, from podcast and then bigger pockets, audio, audible, as you said, you hear, you listen to, to the books on audio and that's like amazing. It was hard because I, I remember buying some audio books, uh, I would say six, seven years ago, and those were on CDs. <laughs> so I'll have to move <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, that's what I used to do. I used to go to uh, Borders. You yeah, have to go to the, Borders. The tap tips when it started with Zig Ziglar and all, and oh, then, yeah. you know, Zim Rohn, and then it, it became the CDs. So it's just so easy. No, I, I, I agree. How do you give back? That's a great question. So I've done in the past, I did, uh, I said in a couple of different charity boards, 100% nonprofits in Chicago. I did the Chef's Hall of Fame for five years, which basically, you know, Chicago is a really big culinary city, just like San Francisco, you know, the winery country over there. Yeah. Um, so we did, we celebrated a lot of the celebrity chefs, but then we would do a event so we could raise money for kids, underprivileged kids that couldn't afford culinary school. So we take the money from that, celebrate the chefs, like here's what you could achieve, provide them those resources. And then they would get, uh, we pay for the scholarships. Uh, I did a couple different charity boards, and I also am really known for my dog. I, my dog's called Brownie. It's a little hot dog. And so I do uh, – I haven't done it the last two years. He's getting older because they get bad backs and little hot dogs. And I, did, I used to do an event every summer. We raised money for homeless dogs and, and awareness, and usually I'd have like three or four dogs get adopted and try to raise you know, a decent amount of money for – they went 100% to like the homeless dogs in Chicago. So, And then this year, we're probably going to start a, a, our own 506 – C3, I think that's the exact name for it, but for, uh, to get back to people that need, that need affordable housing, we're going to provide some kind of, we haven't figured out the structure to it, but we'll, kind of a way to like do community events or if somebody really needs, you know, school supplies or needs something to help them out, we want to do some kind of give, some kind of structure to, you know, giving back. So that's what we're going to do this probably mid-summer next year as well. Because I'm so familiar with the kind of charity boards, they know how to do it. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. So how can my listeners reach out to you? 
Sure. Yeah. So I have uh, for the well, we've mostly spoke uh, the Mobile Home Wealth Academy. I have that's basically the login page. So it's mobilehomewealthacademy.com. That's not actually. I have two funnels, but I'm not putting the funnels up until you know the course content's done. This will be out or this when this airs. It should just about be finishing up, wrapping up. But they could sign up on there, the Mobile Home Wealth Academy. Or if they're a credit investor and they want to learn more about the mobile home park space, uh, MidwestParkCapital.com. Or if they want to, you know, do our, our PPM, which is our private placement memorandum uh, for credit investors, that's MidwestParkCapitalFund.com. Or just Jonathan Tuttle Official on Facebook or Instagram. Awesome. This was great. I definitely learned a lot as well, even though I own a mobile home park. So, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that my listeners are going to get a lot of value out of this. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Wealth Matters podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes so others can enjoy the show too. Have a great week and happy investing.